morning and welcome to your Wednesday devotional. Today we're going to cover Lamentations chapter 3. This is a powerful chapter about the, well, I mean the title is right there, the prophet's anguish and hope, but really it's, it's about Jeremiah's personal reaction and response to Jerusalem falling. It's about him as a leader taking on the place and the empathy of suffering, not only himself, but alongside the people that he has been um, charged with taking care of, that he's been prophesying to, the people that he's been loving on and suffering with them. And then we get a little bit as well, not only about the, the beauty of what the suffering can bring out of it. Remember last week we looked at how suffering can often bring realization, a, a sort of clarity, a recognition of what God is doing and how it's working out. But also suffering can be beautiful at times because as we'll see, suffering can point us to Christ. And that's really the crux of this passage. Suffering can point you to God. Not only will, will it make you realize what God's been doing, not only will it make you recognize and have recognition to your sin and what God, how God can discipline, but it can point you to really hone your your your, your view and 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 zoom in your life on who the Lord is. So I'm gonna pray, and then we'll spend. Um, it's a long chapter; it's 66 verses, but we'll do what we can to uh, to not go so long. Let's pray. Father God, as we go into this passage, I pray, Lord, that you would give me great wisdom to explain the scripture, to expound upon the scripture, Lord, and to honor you as I do it. Lord, we pray that as we see in this chapter that suffering can bring us closer to the Lord Jesus, that we can see in suffering the Lord, um, knowing that you're with us and, and you're going through it with us, Lord. I pray that you'd be honored as we focus in on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. In the New King James Version, it says, I am the man who see who has seen, excuse me, I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He has led me and made me walk in darkness, not in light. Surely he has turned his hand against me time and time again throughout the day. He has aged my flesh and my skin and broken my bones. He has besieged me and surrounded me with the bitterness and woe. He has set me in a dark place like the dead of long ago. So right off the bat, we begin to get back into that view of suffering. What does it feel like to be in the place where you've been completely rebuked and reproved by God, corrected by God, and disciplined by God? Maybe you recognize this phraseology right here, the rod of the Lord. Well, in Psalm 23, it says, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. It was the idea of when a, a sheep would wander away, when it would go away, the shepherd would go and get it and bring it back. And then they'd wander away again, and he would bring it back. And if they continued to do it, the rod would actually be used to break the leg of the, of the lamb so that it could not run away. And the shepherd would hold the sheep himself and carry it until that lamb had begun to heal and recognize its need to be close with the shepherd. And so the, the rod was a disciplining rod. Even uh, in the other scriptures and Proverbs, it talks about the, the discipline of a child that you, you know, don't spare the rod, right? You should raise the child up in a good way through discipline and through you know, righteous instruction. Well, here we have Jeremiah beginning to speak in the first person. I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. God was angry over a sin and he's brought his discipline. Notice as we go through this, that Jeremiah is going to take on not only suffering himself, but the suffering of all the people. He's going to talk about it as though not only he experienced it, but that he is experiencing it on behalf, empathizing with all of Judah. Look, he has led me and made me walk in darkness, not in light. So the Lord has left him in to his own sort of destruction, right? Even though he wasn't a bad guy, he but he's, he's feeling it with the other people. Surely he has turned his hand against me time and time again throughout the day. He has aged my flesh and my skin and broken my bones. It's like the aging of the skin and, and flesh, I mean, Think about how Jeremiah was serving the Lord over many, many years. Decades he was ministering. Decades he was preaching and people never obeyed. People never listened and changed their heart. And when they did, it was only for a short time. For decades he's been ministering and it's 
weighed on him physically. It's weighed on him emotionally. He's been ministering. And now, not only has he been the one reproving the people, telling them right from wrong, telling them that they're in sin, telling them that they need to come close to the Lord, but now he's experiencing with them the suffering of being disciplined. He He's not like Jonah, where Jonah told the Ninevites, you know, God's going to bring judgment upon you. And then he left the city and waited and watched to see what God would do to the people. And God was ultimately gracious in that story. But Jeremiah was preaching and preaching and preaching. And then he lives through the suffering with Judah. He's there when the city is destroyed. He's there and captured by the enemy. He doesn't watch it from far away like if he's spared. No, he goes through the suffering with the people he's been ministering to. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and woe. That word for woe could be hardship or weariness, if you didn't know. He has sent me in dark places like the dead of long ago. Doesn't that sound like almost like he's dying? Like he's like he has died? He's he's saying that he's been set in a dark place like the dead of long ago. It gives you that picture that in the suffering of, of Judah, when the city's being destroyed, when Jerusalem's being destroyed, there is death all around him. And he's going through it with them. He, speaking of God, has hedged me in so I cannot get out. He has made my chain heavy. Even when I cry and shout, he shuts out my prayer. He has blocked my ways with hewn stone. He has made my paths crooked. Notice that he's suffering with them and there's no way out of it. The people are suffering. So Jeremiah, as a good leader, as a good prophet, is going to suffer with the people. He's hedged in. He can't get out. There's no escape. He's chained to it. He cries out, and as God is not listening to the people's prayers because they had been falsely praying and many years had gone on praying to idols, well, now God's not hearing Jeremiah's prayer. He's letting him suffer with the people. He's blocked my ways by a hewn stone and made his paths crooked. It's like he's experiencing whatever the people are experiencing. He has been to me a bear lying in wait, like a lion in ambush. God was out to bring destruction upon the people, not because he hates the people, but because he wants to discipline. He has turned aside my ways and torn me in pieces, made me desolate, has bent his bow and set me up as a target for the arrow. Now notice a lot of this is symbolic, right? It's poetry. It's a funeral dredge. It's a a mourning song. So No, he wasn't completely torn in pieces. Jeremiah is not dead as he writes this, right? And earlier it said that he had broken his bones. That's not a physical breaking of his bones. He's he's, he's more of a, almost like we would speak of a broken heart. It's so inward, the suffering. It's not just what's happening around him, but he's feeling it with the people. Verse 13. He has caused the arrows of his quiver to pierce my loins. I've become the ridicule of all my people, their taunting song all the day. So now, not only is he ridiculed by the enemy, but even the people he's been ministering to taunt him. It's almost like that I can only imagine that they're suffering and then they look and they see Jeremiah suffering with them and they laugh at him like, oh, you thought you were better than us. Maybe, maybe they laugh at him and think, oh, you thought you could escape it, but look, God's brought it upon all of us. And they would ridicule him for that almost like, he's ashamed with them, or maybe they would think, oh, he was just as sinful as we are. But in reality, it's just the opposite. He's innocent and he's experiencing their suffering so that he can empathize, so that he can love them, so that he can minister to them, not from afar, but right up close and personal. He's filled me with bitterness and made me to drink warm wood. He's also broken my teeth with gravel and covered me with ashes. You have moved my soul far from peace. I have forgotten prosperity. And I said, my strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. Now, here's where I think we begin to understand why. Why did God make Jeremiah suffer with the people? Why is it that Jeremiah doesn't just get to prophesy that destruction is coming, but then he has to be a part of the destruction. He has to live and see and be a part of the starvation, be a part of the enemy coming after them, be a part of the struggle. It would have been really easy for Jeremiah to always preach and then never have to be experiencing it. I think about some of our friends and family in the church who have been overseas. They've been to war. They've seen things that just seeing those things 
affects them deeply and personally. And sometimes they take years to battle through, you know, the, the, the nightmares or the traumas of being in war. Whether they were actively participating or not, they saw things, right? And I think Jeremiah's here experiencing it with the people. And I want you to notice that he's experiencing it with the people so that he can then love and minister to the people. He can now, in the next portion, because that opening portion is really all about the suffering, but in the next portion, he's going to be able to bring the people back to thinking about the Lord, thinking about his goodness, his, his mercies, his compassion. And he's going to actually lead the people to the Lord in repentance, in reconciliation with God, not from far away, with a superiority kind of like you messed up and you need to get right with God, but actually he's going to be there saying, we need to get right with God and experience it with them. And Ezra and Nehemiah and David and several other leaders within old Testament scripture, they often said that we have sinned against God, even when they were innocent, they would say, you know, we've fallen, but they hadn't done anything. It was the people who had done something. And so you get this idea that, a good leader experiences, empathizes with his people and doesn't just cut them off and, and, and from a place of pride point down at them. And then that should immediately point you to who Jesus is. It should point you to think about or point you to Jesus. It should make you think about the Lord Jesus because he didn't just from heaven point down and say, oh, you're so messed up. You're such, and you're such sinners. You know, I'm going to punish you for your sin. I'm going to bring wrath upon you. Instead, he comes as a man he becomes incarnate, the God, the Son, taking on humanity for all time. He lives with us. He breathes our air. He eats the same food that we would eat. He walked on the same streets as the disciples walked, right? He was there. He experienced it. He saw the suffering. He felt pain, emotional and physical pain. He was tired. He was hungry. He goes through all of it with us. And then he goes even further than just becoming man. He becomes sin for us. That's at least how Paul put it in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God, that we could transfer. He takes on our sins so that we could take on his righteousness. And the reason why I bring that up because, is because he suffers with us. He came and he died as a man. He was in pain. He was on the cross. He was had the thorns put into his brow. They, they struck him. They beat him. They whipped him. He went through it as a human would. He felt it as any human would because he became just like us. He, he was a leader who stepped into the sins of the world and suffered with us. He didn't do it from far away. I think that's a beautiful thing about Jeremiah is that he doesn't get to walk away and say, okay, well, I told you. I told you to stop, but here comes the destruction from God. Here comes God's wrath. And then he watches it happen. No, he experiences it with them so that he can minister to them. And so that he can encourage them. And we're going to see right now, he's going to help them come out of sin. And the Lord Jesus does it too. He experiences the life that a human lives because he becomes man. And then through his death and his resurrection can call us out of sin, call us out of death, call us into light and into life. And he does this perfectly and gloriously. So much so that you want to worship him. So much so that, you know, whatever you go through, whatever affliction you're in, you know that the Lord Jesus has been through so much worse and he survived and he resurrected. Or well, at least, you know what I mean? He, he died and resurrected this surviving, victorious thing that the Lord Jesus did. And we get to enjoy that same kind of victory over sin and over our flesh and walk with him and then eventually go and be with him in his presence in heaven. But that wouldn't be the case. And it wouldn't be so glorious if he did it from the sidelines. Instead, he gets into the mix and he comes as a man, dies and resurrects. Now, that's the first section. Jeremiah living in the suffering, experienced the suffering with the people. And, and then because he's been in there in the suffering, because he's with them in the pain and in the trial and he's there for the battle then he can be the one who not only is empathizing with them in their suffering but then he can lead them out of it as he calls them to repentance and so we have the second section which is 
sort of 19 through 39, and begins to talk about the characteristics of God, begins to talk about the attributes of God, the things that make him able to forego sin, uh, overcome suffering, and seek the Lord, and know that the Lord is still with him. So look at this. Verse 19, it says, Remember my affliction and roaming, the wormwood and gal. My soul still remembers and sinks within me, this I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. So he's thinking of his affliction and he's asking, you know, those around him and the Lord to think of his affliction. But then he begins to recall something different. He, he, so what comes to mind is something better. And it says that it brings him hope. Verse 22, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. By his compassions, uh, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. So he's suffering. He's in the battle with them. He's empathizing with them. He's dealing with all of it. And then what comes to mind is something about the Lord, and it brings hope into his heart. It brings a new perspective and optimism and a, an expectation of what God can still do in and through them in the future. And what he says is it's through the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. I mean, think about this. They've, the, the walls have been torn down. The temples torn down. The people are taken captive and off to Babylon. He's, he's suffering and the people are starving. And yet he looks at it and he says, but God is still merciful because we're not consumed. We're not completely destroyed. They could have been 100% blotted off the face of the earth, right? They could have been 100% consumed by the Babylonians, no Jew left alive, and boom, it's over, the nation of Israel is gone. But instead, God is merciful to protect those who are taken captive. Eventually, generations, two generations later, many more come back and they rebuild Jerusalem, they rebuild the temple, and they rebuild this with walls to protect them and make themselves a sovereign city and nation again. And the ones who stay there, the Lord protects them as well. It's because of his compassion and because his mercies are new every morning that they're not completely consumed, but he can hold out and say, God is faithful. He made promises to us. We're his covenant people. We're still going to have something in the future. And their inheritance isn't a city or uh, a place, or uh, a size, or a power, but he says, "My the Lord is my portion. That's what I'm satisfied in. That's what keeps me going. And that's what his hope is in. Verse 25, the Lord is good to those who wait, on him, wait for him. So not only can he be in the suffering and then be the leader to say, hey, let's remember who God is, but now he can encourage the people and tell them what they should do. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. To, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Hey, let's not complain about the, the, the destruction that's been brought upon us. Let's not complain about the problems that have come to us, but let's wait on God. Let's seek him and the Lord will save. The Lord will bring his salvation. And then it says, it is good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. It's really important. As parents, we have this privilege to raise up our children to know scripture to know God, to know the things that, that the Bible calls valuable, to have them walk in those perspectives. And the good thing about it is that as we seek the Lord, it's always easier to come to the Lord young, without the bad habits that we've built into ourselves, without the, the routines and the troubles that we've gotten ourselves into. Bringing youth and young people to know the Lord is always going to be so much more fruitful in the sense of... Um, the quality of life that they can have afterwards. People in their old age can still get saved and they can still come to the Lord and have a very fruitful life for him. But it's going to be a battle to overcome, you know, 50 years of bad habits versus 15 years of bad habits. You know what I mean? And then he says, let him sit alone and keep quiet because God has laid it on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. May there, there, may, be, there may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes him and be full of reproach. And so he's talking about someone who would be disciplined by God, someone who would take on that wrath, that rod from God. And you know what? Keep silent, sit before the Lord. The Lord has laid it on you. Just accept it. Go with it. Don't fight back against God's discipline. There's still hope. You know, he says, verse 29, let him put his mouth in the dust. That was a sign of mourning 
in that ancient time. So he says, you know, mourn over your sin, mourn over what you've done and allow the Lord to bring rebuke to you. And when he says, let his cheek, let him give his cheek to the one who strikes him. Remember, the Lord was the one who brought Babylon over to strike them. It was his hand. And, and part of Jeremiah's prophecies often in the book of Jeremiah was let it happen. Don't fight back. Allow Babylon to make you a vassal nation and allow Babylon to do this and that. And when they fought back, when they didn't allow the, the punishment of the Lord, the discipline of the Lord, it got worse and then the city was destroyed. Verse 31, for the Lord will not cast off forever. Though he causes grief, yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies, for he does not afflict willingly nor grieve the children of men. God isn't out to punish because he just likes to see us suffer. He's not afflicting us willingly, but rather because he needs to. He won't cast off forever, but you know what he will keep forever is his covenants. Remember, if you read through the Bible, then you'll maybe remember Deuteronomy 28, 29, and 30, where in Deuteronomy, at the end of the book, after giving all of the law, the Lord makes these promises to them. and says, if you walk with me, you'll be blessed. If you stay with me, you'll be protected. If you walk with me, I'll always provide for you. Your enemies won't prevail against you. All these good things of, of staying with him, but it's conditional. Because then he said, if you don't, if you worship false idols, if you go after money instead of the Lord, if you ignore his law, he said that all the things that they suffered from Babylon would come upon them. He said it would be famine. He said it would be struggles. He said it would be enemies coming against them and them prevailing over them. He said it would even possibly lead towards the starvation that would lead towards a cannibalism that they dealt with, like we read last week. And then at the end in chapter 30, there's still a promise that he says, yet I will bring you home. Yet I will gather you from wherever you go. Yet I will be merciful. And he's promised that even when you're unfaithful, the troubles come in order to make you faithful again. So he doesn't afflict or grieve us purposefully in the sense of he's out to get us or he likes to see us suffer. And then because he doesn't like to see people suffer, because that's not his ultimate goal, we get these three verses, which I really, I love the way it's written. The Lord does not approve to crush under one's feet all prisoners of the earth, to turn aside justice to a man before the face of the Most High, or to subvert a man in his cause. That are things, those are things that the Lord does not approve. So to crush under one's feet all prisoners of the earth would be like, you know, to take someone who is um, a prisoner and then to harm them beyond what is due for their sins, for their crimes. And then if you take that a little bit more poetically, it's not God's will to crush under his feet all of the humankind, prisoners of the earth, people who are stuck here on earth. Verse 35, to turn aside justice to a man. You know, the Lord doesn't want things to be unjust. He doesn't want people to have things happen to them and then not have the retribution place, not have his due ju ju judgment and vengeance happen for them. For a man did not receive justice is just as bad as someone who is, you know, persecuted for something they didn't do. And then it says, before the face of the Most High, or to subvert a man in his cause. You know, don't pull the rug out from someone. Don't harm them for no good reason. Don't Stop them from whatever good that they're doing. That does, The Lord doesn't approve of that. So he doesn't like oppression or injustice. That's not his character. And so when they're being oppressed by their enemies, when they're suffering for what they did, it's not because God is just out to get them. He who speaks, oh, excuse me, who is he who speaks and it comes to pass when the Lord has not commanded it? So who gets to tell God what to do? You know, what comes to pass is what the Lord commands. It is not from the mouth of the uh, excuse me, is it not from the mouth of the Most High that woe and well-being proceed? Why should a man, why should a living man complain a complain a man for the punishment of his sins? I gotta slow down. I'm just talking too fast. It's out of the Lord's mouth that come woe and well-being. A living man shouldn't complain for the punishment of his own sins. He should accept it and walk in it. And so Jeremiah suffers with them. Then he calls to mind the goodness of God and the mercies of God, and he can lead them towards that. And then he can talk about 
all of the character of God, that he doesn't love to punish, he doesn't love to cause suffering, but rather he wants justice and he wants goodness. And why would we complain over suffering for our own sins? But notice this verse, that woe and well-being proceed from the Lord. And that really is the truth. Woe and well-being proceed from the Lord. When we walk in rejection of God, when we choose sin, when we go the other way, woe is pronounced upon us. The bitterness of life, the struggles and the trials and the tribulations that come with suffering and consequences that come with our sin. But the Lord also loves to give well-being. He likes to bless and protect and and, and, and encourage and support those who walk with him. And so in Christ, we have this same kind of picture. There was woe pronounced upon him. He was the suffering servant. He died, and yet he was well. He, the well-being came from the Lord. He resurrected from the dead and lives on. And so we can either live in our woes, the suffering of our own sins, and as well the eternal suffering of our sins, or we can come to know the Lord and walk with him not complain, seek him, surrender to him, trust in his mercies, and then well-being will proceed from the Lord and we'll accept the goodness of God. We'll walk in the goodness of God and we'll enjoy the goodness of God. Look at verse 40. There's a bit of a change here. If, if verses 1 through 18 was all about the suffering that Jeremiah participates in, though he doesn't deserve to and it points to Christ, and Verses 19 through 39 talk about the character of God where he doesn't want to just punish for no good reason. He's not wanting to afflict us. Verse 40 begins then the proper response to it all. And so it says, let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. But Jeremiah says, hey, everybody, let us seek God. And notice that he uses the word us. Let us lift our hearts and hands to God in heaven. We have transgressed and rebelled and, we, and you have not pardoned. He's saying us, even though he didn't commit any sins. I may have said this already, but Ezra, Nehemiah, David, other biblical leaders often said when the kingdom failed, when there was sin in the camp, when there was troubles, that they themselves would say, we have suffered, we have sinned, we have turned and rebelled against God. But they hadn't done anything wrong. It was just that they were a leader. They're identifying with their people. And so Jeremiah does the same thing here. And he says, he not only identifies and says, we have done what's wrong, but we need to seek the Lord. And so he wants to lead them in seeking the Lord. And then he says, you have not pardoned. And that isn't to say that God doesn't want to forgive. It simply means that God does not let sin slide. He doesn't ignore or turn a blind eye to it. And so he has to deal with it. Verse 43, you have covered yourself with anger and pursued us. You have slain and not pitied. You have covered yourself with a cloud that prayer should not pass through as though he's unattainable, unreachable. You have made us an offscoring and refuse in the midst of the people. So we're, we're like scum and refuse. That's, what's it, that's what it's like to live in our sins. All our enemies have opened their mouths against us. Fear and a snare have come upon us, desolation and destruction. And those are all the us portions. He's saying this is what we are. This is what's happened to us. But then he leads by example and he says, my eyes overflow with the rivers of water for destruction for the destruction of the daughter of my people. He says, I'm mourning over sin. I'm crying about the sin. I'm dealing with the sin. And so he suffers with them. He points them to the good character of God. He calls them to repentance. And then he shows them the way of repentance. First, we have to realize what our sin is and mourn over our sin and recognize that it's wrong and everything that comes from it. My eyes flow and do not cease without interruption till the Lord from heaven looks down and sees my eyes bring suffering to my soul because of all the daughters of my city. So he's suffering and he's leading them to see what it looks like to be in the suffering of sin. And then he begins to do something new here. In verse 52, he begins to talk about the other things that had happened in his life and how he had suffered in the past and how God always responded. So notice this in verse 52, my enemies without cause hunted me down like a bird. They silenced my life in the pit and threw stones at me. The waters flowed over my head. I said, I am cut off. Now in Jeremiah, there's a story in the book of Jeremiah. There's a story about Jeremiah that he was lowered into a cistern. So a cistern would be like a deep reservoir of water where there would be one you know, mouth at the top and, and they would have put him, either thrown him in or lowered him in, but he couldn't have gone out except for by rope or by help. 
So he's trapped in there. And when he's put down there, it's, the, it's a bit of a torture. But if they were throwing stones at him, then they were trying to kill him. The waters flowed over my head. I said, I'm cut off. So he's, he's put down in the pit. And it's almost like, you know, the pit of despair, almost the, the, the picture of the pit of death. You know, he, he was as good as dead. But he called out to the Lord. I called on your name, O Lord, from the lowest pit. You have heard my voice. Do not hide your ear from my sighing, from my cry for help. You drew near on that day. I called you and said, do not fear. Obviously, Jeremiah lives because he lives on to read, to write um, Lamentations and to do the rest of his ministry. But he's lowered into the place of death. He's almost dead. He's as good as dead. And yet when he calls out to the Lord, the Lord answers. And so from that, he takes that as an object lesson that, you know, we're in the suffering right now, guys. Look at Jerusalem. It's totally destroyed. Our people are taken captive. But if we call to the Lord, he will hear. O oh Lord, you have pleaded my case for my soul. You have redeemed or, or delivered would be another way to put that in my life. O oh Lord, you have seen how wrong how I am wronged. Judge my case. You have seen all their vengeance, all their schemes against me. So not only is he, is he saying that God's going to deliver, but now he's even saying that God's going to enact judgment on those who punished him. You have heard their reproach, O oh Lord, and all their schemes against me. Their lip, the lips of my enemies, and they're whispering against me all day. Look at their sitting down and their rising up. I am, t- I am their taunting song. So they make fun of him. They, 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 they live a life of accusing and, and, and taunting him. Repay them, O oh Lord, according to the work of their hands. Give them a veiled heart, which would be like a blinded heart. Your curse be upon them. So they've done wrong, and now don't let them realize they've done wrong. wrong. Instead. Judge them. <laughs> Don't let them repent. Just judge them. Your curse be upon them. In your anger, pursue and destroy them from under the heavens of the Lord. Now notice he says, your curse be upon them. In Genesis, Abraham was promised that whoever blessed him and his offspring would be blessed. Whoever cursed him and his offspring would be cursed. And so we get to a really interesting discussion here. There's a bit of a paradox here. God purposely used Babylon to attack Jerusalem, to level Jerusalem, to be the ones to, he, he stirred up that kingdom as we've been studying in the book of Daniel. He raised up Nebuchadnezzar for that purpose to level Jerusalem, to be the one who would be the acting hand of God's discipline and wrath over his own people. And it would purify them and it would be good for them. And it would in the long run be a blessing to them. But then Jeremiah is saying here, And other scripture elsewhere talks about how God was going to judge Babylon for their destruction of Jerusalem. God moved them to do it and yet judges them for it. And so we have a bit of a paradox here. And let me explain how it works. The uh, the Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar were bloodthirsty. They were power hungry. They were going to want a big kingdom anyway. God stirred them up to be the kingdom that they became. And as Proverbs says that he could turn the heart of a king just like he could turn a river, um, he turns Nebuchadnezzar's head to look towards Israel. And Nebuchadnezzar's sinful character takes over. He's a pagan. He's a sinner. He he wants kingdom power. He's got a God complex. He's going to do it anyways. Only God purposely allows him to do it so that it's disciplined. Otherwise... God would have empowered Jerusalem and they would have overcome Babylon and God would have empowered Judah and the armies and and the line of David would have stood strong and they would have kept their borders because God would protect them and bless them like any other enemy. But because they were in sin, God withholds his power from them. We read that in chapter two of Lamentations. God withholds his empowerment from them so that when the enemy comes, it's an act of judgment upon his people. But that doesn't mean that the bloodthirsty, power-hungry sins of the Babylonians go left unchecked. Just because God used them and their sinful nature to do what he already kind of wanted to have happen doesn't mean that they didn't do it out of their own volition, out of their own free will. You think about the Pharisees. You know, they, they put Jesus to death. They, they accused him. They attacked him. They, they got him arrested and they had him crucified. Did God cause them to do that? No, because God's not the author of sin. Ezekiel says that the 
that God takes no um, pleasure in the death of the wicked and that sinful characteristics do not come from the Father. Uh, the, the book of 1 John talks about the, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life are not of the Father. Nothing sinful ever comes from God. Know that. And so when the Pharisees do this sinful thing to attack Jesus, it was already God's plan that Jesus would die and resurrect, right? He was coming to be the suffering servant. Only that they were already power hungry, already sacrilegious and only religious in action and name, but not in heart, that when you put the, the Savior in front of them, their jealousy would take over. And so God didn't cause them to attack Jesus, though he foresaw that they would when he would place the Savior before them, they would go after and attack and crucify. And so even this points us a little bit towards Jesus and shows us how God works sovereignly, that he doesn't have to supernaturally, you know, make someone do something. Their free will does it on their own. They're, he knows what they will do. He understands their character. He knows every possible outcome of anything. And he uses that to his advantage to make sure that what he wants to happen always happens. It, one more example, though, the Lord told the Pharisees that if he had come to Sodom and Gomorrah, if he had revealed himself to Sodom and Gomorrah, that they would have turned and responded to him. If the light that Jesus was, was given to Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have turned. But he didn't do that. Well, he doesn't owe anyone more revelation than he's already given them, for one. But secondly, isn't it interesting that the Lord knows what would have happened if he had acted differently? Because he knows the free will decisions of man. He's sovereign. He foresees. But that doesn't mean that he forecauses sinners to sin. God used Babylon, but he didn't cause Babylon. Does that make sense? Babylon was already a power-hungry, bloodthirsty kingdom, and God used them to do his bidding, to be the disciplining hand against his people. But Jeremiah realizes those who cursed Israel will be cursed, and so he says, Lord, repay them. They're sinners. Don't let them get away with it. In your anger, pursue them and destroy them from under the heavens of the Lord. And so with that, we finish on this big idea that the Lord Jesus is pointed to here. Jeremiah suffers with his people. He then points them to righteousness in God and the, the good character of God. And then he leads them to seek God. And he's there in the equation. He lives it with them. And just like the Lord Jesus who came and lived out that life with us, he, he was a human. He died a human death and then resurrects. And he doesn't want punishment. He doesn't want to cause suffering, but he is a righteous God. He will not um, let sin go off untouched. As it says, he will not pardon it for nothing. He dies so that anybody who wants to be saved, anybody who wants or chooses to be forgiven can be forgiven, but he will judge sin, not just on the cross, but through hell and through eternal punishment and through the life consequences that naturally happen when people involve themselves in sin. So, all right, we finished Lamentations 3. It was a long chapter, but let's, let's finish in prayer. Father, bless those who listen and know this study and understand these verses and learn these concepts. Help them to walk with you and help us understand that suffering can be beautiful because it points to Jesus. And we know that you came to suffer, my Lord. You, you came as the suffering servant to take on our sins. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless and take care.